All right, Josh Smith here, live at my Flat 5 studio. Today's guest is uh, actually a real friend of mine. You know, it's funny in <laughs> business, you cross paths with musicians and, you know, it's like, oh, that dude's my bro, or oh, I love that guy, and oh, yeah, that, that dude's my favorite. Whatever, like, some of them actually become real friends, and I consider this person a real friend. Well, hey, uh, he plays in... Man. Well, thanks, man. He plays in. You know how it is. It's puppy. real friends if if we text each other about completely unrelated BS that's not music related. Then you're real friends. Is that the? Yeah, I know. Maybe I don't know. I have a real friend when I can text him, you know, something very filthy or dirty, and it's okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Sorry, I interrupted your show. It's all right. I like it though. All right. Okay. So he he plays in Snarky Puppy. He plays in the Fearless Flyers. He has his own trio and a number of records out that are tremendous. Um, you should be looking at him and listening to him and following him. You probably do because he got like 780 million followers. <laughs> but <laughs> subtract 780.4 million, and then we're and then we got it. I was close. Anyways. Yeah. I think I first met you when you were on the road with Erica Badu and I was on the road with Rafael Sadiq. Was that the first time we actually met? Yeah, I came up to you in the airport and kind of like broed you down a little bit and you were like, yeah, all right, rocket pedals, cool, man. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's right, rocket pedals. Thank you, rocket pedals. Um, that was it. <laughs> and that was, that was, the rest, as they say, is history. Like, oh, yeah, man. Well, uh, uh, looking forward to seeing your set. I'm, I'm going to get on my flight now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You were much nicer than that. You don't have to lie. I probably was a dick. I don't know if you sm you didn't smile a whole lot, but that may have just been like because Do of I the air travel. A lot ever? I you know. Smiling now. That's true. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's for the YouTube audience's right. benefit. Yeah, it's all fake. Yeah. Oh man. Well, dude, thank you for doing this. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, for sure, and, man. You know. Of course. And um, so. Man, what's been interesting to me in kind of talking to all my friends and finding out their stories, I don't often know 100% whether they come from a musical family or how the guitar ended up in their hands. Uh, I, I don't come from a musical family, so the, it was happenstance, you know. My dad bought me a guitar completely random. What, what was your path kind of? Did you play any other instruments first, or did you have musicians in your family? How did the guitar end up in your hands? Yeah. Well, no professional musicians. Um, my dad plays a little bit of guitar. Um, so he's, there's always been an acoustic in, in our house. You know, he, um, both of my parents are children of the sixties. And so they grew up with Crosby, Stills, Nash and, and all that great stuff. And so um, my earliest memories of guitar were him, you know, just strumming bird songs on the acoustic, you know, that kind of thing. And so it was always around, um, and probably a lot like you, you know, they, my folks had great taste in music, thankfully. And so my house was always filled with great rock and roll and Motown and R&B and, you know, pop and soul and all the good stuff that we all, you know, cherish so, so well. And so um, I kind of stumbled on to actually playing it, though, because I guess I was 11. And, you know, when you're 11 and you're you kind of discovering music on your own and maybe it's not the music that your parents listen to for me it was you know 90s grunge rock you know sound garden and stone table pilots and all that stuff and so i was hearing these songs on the radio at the same time as i was kind of like just plinking around on my dad's guitar he would let me do that you know he wasn't like a super protective about it or anything and so um and i remember one day he was just like do you want like guitar lessons or something and i was like yeah sure you know, like didn't really think anything of it. Um, and then I, so I started taking some guitar lessons from a friend's mom and I was like, whoa, an A chord sounds like the A chord that I'm hearing on the radio from the Gin Blossoms or whoever it is. <laughs> and so I started making this kind of connection that like I could sort of harness this power of rock, you know? Yeah. And, and it, yeah, and so the, he was the first song that you learned then. <laughs> no, actually, the first song I ever learned was Sloop John B by the Beach Boys. Oh, OK. Well, that's, um, that's a good one. All right. No, yeah. You know, get, get a couple open chords rocking in there and you're fine. But I remember like going to a guitar store around, the, you know, 11 or so. And I had been playing for two months or something. I knew like two chords. And uh, the store owner guy manager was, you know, I was like, well, if, you, hey, if you're interested in electric guitars, you know, we got these over here. And so he plugged me into this, I think it was like a Ibanez something RG thing into a crate 
distortion amp. It was like, actually, you know what? I still have it <laughs> somewhere as a crate GX 15 or GXR 15 or something. Sure. And, um, he turned on the distortion channel and I played wild thing by the Trogs. Yeah. And it was the first time I'd ever played a distorted guitar. And I was just like, my mind exploded. I mean, it was like, this is the thing. This is, I have to do this. I don't know what this is, but this feeling that I have right now, I never want it to go away. And, um, so long story short, we ended up back at that guitar shop a while back, bought a Fender Squire Stratocaster and, uh, and that crate amp. And that was, we were off at that point. Yes. And that feeling of, I, I remember that feeling of getting a practice amp that had distortion in it oh, and not best. even knowing what it was. Cause nobody told me or explained it to me. Yeah. Um, my first teacher was a jazzer. And I don't think he even acknowledged the fact that, like, other music existed. You know, and I'm six years old, so I didn't know either to, to ask about it. six. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't know to acknowledge, like, tell me to ask about, like, some of the, like, I, my dad listened to Hendrix a lot in the house. But right. I didn't know, like, to ask the teacher, like, what's the difference in the sound of his guitar and what you're showing me right now, you know? And But, yeah, yeah I had, a, like, three-quarter scale fendery looking guitar was my first mm -hmm. electric and the first practice amp i don't think it was a gorilla but it might have been it only had one knob just volume you know nice it, it, it didn't distort <laughs> but the second one was a crate absolutely and it had a little sure. switch on the front to engage mm -hmm. distortion and it was like yeah mind-blowing it's, da it's down there if we get a second i'll i'll <laughs> pick it up but um, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. never get rid of. Well, I get rid of some gear, but that's I, that thing will stay with me forever. Mine are still, you know, and it had a reverb. They still have them. like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So, oh, man. yeah, I mean that was it, man. I mean, you know, and it, that was the that was the amp and the guitar that I took to my band rehearsals with my garage band with my buddies, you know, and we would. So this is uh, in California, right? Yeah, this is in the Bay Area in Menlo Park. Right. You know, known for its breeding ground of rock superstars, you know. <laughs> well, actually, uh, Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham went to my high school, which I think is kind of cool. <laughs> Not when I was there, of course, but. Um, so you're taking lessons, you're getting new guitars, you, you're listening to grunge, which is what's popular at the time. And uh, so you're making friends who also play and you're starting to play with guys your age? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the thing. It was like me and my buddies all kind of discovered this at the same time. Like one of my best friends also uh, started learning guitar and actually his mom was, the, was who was my first teacher. Um, so we were learning at the same time and we would always be over at each other's houses, uh, showing each other whatever tab we downloaded from, you know, the internet. And, uh, and then we met another good friend who was a drummer and then another friend who was a guitar player, but he decided he wanted to play bass. So then we had a little band and playing at school dances and backyard parties and, you know, not like the backyard parties that Van Halen was doing, but like, you know, as best we, <laughs> as best we could. <laughs> So that was it, man. Very so typical. Having guys your age, that camaraderie thing, and you kind of spur each other along, that must have been, like, really nice to have dudes who were into the same stuff you were into who were your friends and kind of push each yeah. other along. Yeah, it was never, like, a a weird a weird thing. It was just like, hey, let's have garage band practice at Owen's house, and then we'll order a pizza and then, like, go, you know, screw around at the Jack in the Box or whatever. <laughs> it's like... It's just like, you know, teen, tween stuff, man. You know, just dudes hanging out, playing Metallica tunes, and then, like, riding our bikes and getting in trouble. <laughs> I mean, that's a great – that's the best. Yeah, you that's know. what – it was the best. It really yeah. was. It was the best, yeah. So so when you get into high school, when does it become, like, a, a little more serious? And also, did you have music in high school at all? Yes, we did. And so – so, you know, I got serious about it pretty quick. Uh, it was never a, I mean, even though it was a sort of a, a social thing with my friends, we were all very serious. You know, we were really, really trying to practice a lot and write songs together and, you know, get good. Um, and so it was definitely serious. But when I got to high school, I was really into sports growing up too. So that was kind of like a whole other thing. Yeah, I ran track. And so that was like a big, a big passion and priority for me too. So, um, my after school 
stuff was mostly sports related, uh, which meant I could I didn't really do any of the music programs that our school had because that's the way it would take place at the same time. Um, but my senior year, I, my schedule had sort of shifted. And so I was able to join the jazz band at, our, at my high school. Um, and that was really cool because I was not a jazz guitar player at all. Uh, I just knew it was like, oh yeah, jazz, this is important music. If I want to be good at stuff, I should at least try this out, you know? And uh, so it taught me how to read a chord chart. Um, never been a great sight reader, but it got me like reading charts and kind of like forms and chord symbols and things like that, which were new to me at, you know, 16, 17. Um, and it was fun because I got, you know, you sort of, I was like, oh, the Freddie Green, what is this kind of rhythm guitar? I don't know what this is. Okay. You know, and my jazz, the jazz teacher of my high school was great. He was hilarious. His name was Frank Mora and he was a really talented cat. And uh, that band actually would play at the Montreux Jazz Festival every other year as one of the high school sort of featured bands, except the year I joined was the year, was their off year. <laughs> so I didn't get to go, but um uh, anyway, so that was a really great experience, just kind of being in a large ensemble, um, just learning, you know, new sounds, new chords, new harmony, that kind of stuff, you know, playing Satin Doll and being like, well, this is not Enter Sandman. <laughs> all on Green, Green Dolphin Street, uh, Take Red Snapper. Uh, it's yeah. all the same same ones at every high school across America. We played yeah. a bunch of Sammy Nestico charts too. I think I remember. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. But and uh, there was always that special moment, whatever, like junior year, when they would break out the uh, squib cakes chart, and we'd be like, "Oh, we get to play something kind of fun, a like, funk be... tune." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm trying oh, to think man. what our funk tune. Uh, I can't remember. I don't know. It, it I'm wasn't tested. squid cakes? Really? I don't, it may have been. I, maybe we, we did, I don't know if we had, the the tune for us was this one called Marguerite, which I think was a Sammy Nestico tune, which was like a Latin funk groove thing. So that was, I had a guitar solo on that one. It was like a big deal for me. So, guitar solo. <laughs> Were your friends doing any gigs of any kind during high school? Were you, were you getting into bit. any paid situation? Uh, Not that, not like that. I mean, we would play at school functions on occasion. And then like in Menlo Park, there weren't really that many venues necessarily. I mean, there, we had like teen centers, uh, which were these like sort of social centers that there would be like, you know, a pool table and like some arcade games and like, you know, a, basically like a place where you could just throw your own show and invite your own friends. And they were really big with like the punk bands. They would play at these places a lot, but like, yeah, there weren't really many clubs that we would play at, and we kind of didn't really even know how to do that, really. Um, but we would play at school stuff. We would play occasionally, like, at my church. That was another thing I, I, I should probably talk about. Um, I was in, I, My church had this, like, Wednesday night, like, youth meeting thing uh, called Breakaway. And what was cool about it, it was sort of like this hang with music and games and, you know, goofy stuff. And they would have, like, a message at the end of it, but... Uh, really just kind of like a social thing, but the band would play, we didn't play worship music. We played like secular tunes. And like, so we would play everything from Bob Marley to Santana to Metallica to, I, mean, I think we actually played an Alice in Chains song and the youth pastor sang it, um, wow. which was <laughs> just pretty amazing. Um, so that was really fun because I was like doing this every week, playing with musicians that were way above me, uh, in skill they were a little bit older um so i got to learn from them and a lot of those cats are now professional players as well doing some pretty good stuff you know some really sizable gigs um so that was that kind of maybe took the place of like being in a gigging band as a high schooler i guess i was kind of doing this thing at, at the breakaway thing at my church so you were keeping um, yourself busy man you I was and super field busy. and gigs yeah, and church. I mean, yeah. yeah, I was like, you know, and I think maybe the, the, part of it was just like being a product of the Silicon Valley sort of like, dichot you know, the thing. It's like the kids are just busy. You, you know, you sign up for as many things as you can so you can make your college thing look good. <laughs> you, I mean, it is what it is, man. I can't, I'm not, I can't like but I'm grateful for it because it gave me a really serious work ethic and taught me how to handle a lot of things at, at one time. And, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, I was in class and, and track and bands and, you know, social life and 
you know, teen, 100% teen. <laughs> Getting through high school and it becomes like, you know, the thought process of, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to college? Am I not going to college? Was that even an option? What was the, your parents' attitude on it? What was your attitude yeah. on Am I going to be a right. musician or what at that time? You know, it was definitely it was definitely like you know let's let's try to go to college let's let's do the thing you know, um, and so, the, but the idea of, of pursuing music as a as a degree or, or a profession was not really uh, on the table. Um, not because it was this it wasn't discouraged at all. It just wasn't where my head was at. You know, I I, I think it was because I just couldn't quantify it yet. Um, I didn't understand what a session player was. I didn't understand all these other roles you could have as a musician beyond like being in a famous band. Right. And that's just, you know, that's just kind of uh, what I understood at that point. And so for me, it was like, well, I'm going to go to college and pursue, you know, a degree that I, I, I think is tangible. That's interesting to me, which at the time was advertising, um, public relations, which is kind of the family business that I came from. And I would sort of play music on the side and, you know, maybe this music thing will take off, right? But, but by the end of college, I had gotten so into the music thing and so not really into the advertising thing uh, that music became the clear professional choice. And, and a lot of it was because I was just getting a lot better and I was learning how the business worked and I was learning how to, how to do it beyond just being in a band that quote unquote made it, you know? Did you take music classes at college or no? A little bit. Yeah, I took a semester of music theory, uh, which was really great because um, it was mostly classical music theory, but th my professor was the guy who introduced me to Shuggy Otis, <laughs> uh, who became like a big influence. You know, it's like yeah. Shuggy's amazing, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the thing I took most from that class about classical music theory was Shuggy Otis, you know. Uh, and then I studied for about a year and a half with the jazz guitar teacher on campus, uh, this guy named Tom Burchill, uh, who was great. And, and we, he taught me jazz as it sort of would have more apply to kind of what I wanted to do, not really to be like a straight ahead guitar jazz player. Um, <clears throat> so he got me learning chords, a lot of harmony stuff and like kind of how to write chord progressions too. I took a lot of that from him. Um, but, but really my education there beyond, you know, beyond those specific things was like yeah i started a band but now i can play in bars you know because i'm 18 19 20 and so now i can play in bars and stay out till two in the morning and you know do whatever and so that's what we would do um but i was also running track so <laughs> so the whole thing just kind of continued from high school you know it's just texas, do a lot right? yeah at texas christian university at fort worth so you were running track in college too right yeah. right yeah Man, yeah, you, so that's get up early after a gig, right? <laughs> well, I sort of would time it. If I had a meet, I definitely would not play. But there were times when I would have a meet come home and play. Uh, and that was always interesting, you know, getting off the bus, sweaty, beat up, tired, take a shower, go to the moon bar on Berry Street with my jam band and nice. rock out till 2 a.m. and wake up at 2 the next day. <laughs> So, yeah. So were you under like, like, you know, the notion, the whatever operating under the disguise or notion or whatever that you were going to be an Olympic medalist member of the <laughs> Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Never. Uh, I okay. mean, I guess those were well, I should say that, yes, those were the two loftiest of, yeah. of lofty goals. Right. Yeah. Um, athletics for me, you know, I kind of peaked in college in a sense that like it became very apparent that I was not going to be winning championships or being on any sort of Olympic team or anything like that. I was just doing it because I loved the sport and kind of wanted to uh, just for my own sake, accomplish the goal of, of competing in division one track and field for four years. Yeah. Right. I wasn't any good. I had a lot of energies, but I had a lot of fun. I did a lot of cool things, was on a championship team. Like it's kind of a, this is actually probably a whole other podcast we could have about this <laughs> part of my life, but um, cause I don't talk about it much, but, um, you know, the, the, towards the end of that, the music thing started becoming more apparent, you know, like I could be I, successful at this. I can you relate. Know? I mean, I only ever wanted to be 
a second baseman in the major leagues or, or a guitar player. And I was yeah. okay at baseball. I played in high school. I could, you know, I don't think I could have made it to the major leagues, but I could have tried. I probably could have played yeah. in college had I gone to college. Um, but yeah, it was apparent. Wait a minute. I'm way better at guitar though, especially sure. when I started seeing bigger, stronger, faster guys and, and, and pitches started going 90 something miles an hour, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Sports is, it's very objective. It's yeah. like, it's, yeah. it's either going to work out for you or it's not, you know, um, so you, you can, can yeah, fun. you can, it's like, you can work as hard as you want, but you might just not have it. <laughs> Yeah, it might just not be your thing. So if you're having yeah. fun doing it, cool. And I think for me, it was like by the time I was finished my senior year with track, it was like, cool, that chapter's done. I'm proud of myself for doing what I did. Um, but this this thing that I do with music is I'm going to really have to like push on this because I think this could do something, <laughs> something. It could be a career, right? And it's fun and I love it. So, you know, we'll kind of make that shift now, I think. So, so, I get it, man. I totally see your point. Yeah. So you're making friends in in college, and you're playing in jam bands and other bands, and and you're getting better as a musician. Uh, quick, you know, because I mean, we're so driven at that point. You when you when you realize this is what you want to be, it's right. like you can't you can't even turn it off. It just it just happens all the time. You're always progressing so fast. So when when college starts to wind down. Do, do the parents sit you down and be like, well, what are you going to do, you know, with this advertising degree or whatever, you know, and um, you have to explain to them, uh, yeah, I'm not going to use it at all. Right. Uh, I, the, the, that conversation existed, but maybe not quite along those same parameters, but it was definitely like, a, you know what it was? I think they kind of, they knew they could see it. You know, they, yeah, your parent, if you're, you, you got, you have kids, you can see when they are really a, a, attached to something. And so um, I had had an internship with a PR firm uh, one summer before my senior year. And I, and it just didn't pan out the way I thought it would. And I think a lot of it was kind of just because my head wasn't in it. You know, I'd be sitting at my desk writing a press release, waiting till five o'clock so I could go home and practice or jam or like sit in at my friend's blues jam or something, you know, like it just wasn't there. And so when I graduated, I didn't really have a lot of job prospects, to be honest. I mean, it was like, so I just kind of told my folks, I was like, I think I'm going to stay in Texas for a little while and just at least try this music thing. And they were like, okay, you know, like we're here for you. If you need to come home, like, or what, you know, whatever, like I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that I had that support system, you know, um, but, but then they, but they left me on my own. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, well you gotta, you know, cut off, do your thing now. Okay. And so, and so I did, yeah, I just, just kind of started working and slowly built it up and, and took a day gig at a little marketing sales company just to kind of keep the rent going. Um, but again, it was like one of those things that I, I guess I'm glad that I was so busy in high school because it prepared me because I was working a day job and then working at night, you know, uh, gigging and doing all the sessions and stuff. And then finally, I think really, it just was like I had saved up enough money where I could just sort of maybe not go to my nine to five for a while. And then it was another whole step like, okay, mom and dad, I'm going to leave this job, but now it's just music. <laughs> so it was a gradual kind of step, you know, like, you know, I had to kind of prove, not really prove myself, but, but yeah, in a sense, like show that this could be a thing. Oh, yeah. You know, I still think my mom thinks I'm going to go work for an advertising agency though. Pretty soon. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember but, as a kid, my parents were big Bruce Springsteen fans. They still are. And I, I am too, honestly, I'm a Bruce fan, but there was his live album from the eighties and he, he's telling, he's, you know, he's always telling stories in these songs, but in the one he's talking about his parents are in their audience and how they, they still always tell him, you know, it's not too late. You could go back to college. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, my parents were never quite, my grandparents. Yes. But my parents were always very, very supportive. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Oh man. So it's, it's amazing though. The, the termination level that happens where we're trying to save money and be responsible just so we can we can then jump further off the deep end and, and do it responsibility yeah, yeah yeah it's always the way yeah. it works it's that's pretty much i mean yeah the career as an artist is like 
yeah, you get to a certain point and then you take all the things that you have gained and then you get rid of them all so that you can build it all back up again. But, you know, every time you want to make an artistic statement, you just like open the floodgates, drain everything and then build it all back up again, hopefully with one step closer to where you want to be. Well, it's because you know you need that 100% of your focus going towards <laughs> it to, to really do it right. So it's yeah. like that period when you don't get to share 100% of your effort on something, it's like, yeah, it's the buildup where you're, you're just getting yourself ready for being able to put everything else to the wayside, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Dude, so, so then what, what happens? And you've graduated college, you're gigging, you give up your day job. Mm -hmm. when, when does it become apparent, like, oh, man, I can pay my bills, and I've kind of found, found like, you know, maybe maybe you're not doing your own music yet at that point, but at least you found like right. a, a way to to pay your bills and be happy. When when does that yeah. feel like you you found that? I mean, so I did the I did I was at this little marketing company for about two years, two and a half years. So let's see, I got out of college at 21, so this was, you know, 23, 23 and a half or something. Uh, and um, I I just I think what it was is I had finally reached the point where I was actually like really kind of getting burned out because I was where I did have gigs. I was working, I was doing a, playing at a church on Sundays. I was playing in a couple different like original projects, uh, freelancing with different artists or bands, you know, who needed a guitar player doing a lot of cover band stuff, you know, the top 40 wedding thing. Um, and it was just enough uh, to where I said, okay, well, one of these things has to go. And obviously it's not gonna be music. So um, that's where I kind of made the transition. And I just kept the same hustle mentality you know i mean it was like take take any gig with anybody for any amount of money it didn't really matter i mean because there was something for me to learn from every experience um you know i answered gigs off craigslist and stuff you know nothing wrong with that you know just tr yeah. just trying to i was trying everything you know to keep it to keep it going and so yeah maybe about like 20 23 ish um there started to be just kind of a flow of stuff you know, just ran, just all kinds of stuff, man. You know, duo gig at a wine bar. Okay. <laughs> you know, me and a singer at a wine bar or whatever it is. You know, top 40 gig on Saturday, Sunday morning uh, church thing, you know, a uh, little recording session thing on a, you know, on a Monday night with a friend making a praise and worship record or whatever it is. Um, all little types of things. And, and throughout this whole thing, I was expanding my versatility, my, you know, my ability to try and at least be somewhat convincing in a multitude of styles so that I could answer as many of the gig calls as I got. Um, I, yeah, I find, you know, I a way better musician, you know, and uh, you can't replace that, that work experience. You know, it's like all the training and the schooling and this and that, there's no substitute for that $70 gig that you just played at the wine bar duo, right. you know, a bunch of tunes that you didn't know until the night before and getting right. thrown. Into the, it's like, you can't replace that. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And, and, you know, this whole time, you know, I was, I had an original rock band that I had started with some friends, um, right at the end of college. And so I was kind of managing that and writing songs for that. And then, so that put me in kind of like the band management mentality of like booking gigs and like, you know, renting a van and getting my merch together and like all these other sort of things you don't think about when you just want to play the guitar, you know? Right. Um, but it was, I mean, it was a grind, dude. I mean, you know, and we, you know, Snarky Puppy was getting started around that time and I would start playing with them and we were driving eight, ten, nine, ten hours sleeping on a floor, you know, playing a gig and everybody gets 20 bucks or what. <laughs> but you, but when you're 25, you're like, this, this is what I'm, this is it. Like, yeah. this is what you do. You know, I wouldn't, I can't imagine not doing that. Yeah. Right. It, it's just part of the grind, man. Oh yeah. I mean, it is. It's what you do. In a way. You know, that's when you do it. <laughs> when you don't have a lot of right, bills, you don't, you have, don't have a lot of responsibilities. You know, I, you know, until I met my wife, it was like it didn't matter that I made any money. I live with my parents. It didn't matter. Sure. You know that I owned anything at all, any clothing yeah. or any anything. You know, like so. Yeah, I lived in a van all the year long, traveling that's around. It. It didn't matter if it was seven hours between gigs. I'll drive it. I'm indestructible. You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> There's a Waffle House. I can manage. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, but it, it's it's also incredibly fun and incredibly like formative. Like it makes you who you're going to end up being yeah. as a musician, you know. Yeah. Which is again, you can't replace that real world experience. So, all right. So, so you're working. You're starting to do sessions. Snarky puppy starts. Um, when do you start to feel like a, an adult musician? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like, like, yeah. I don't know. It, it's twelve thirty on a Tuesday here. I, I don't know if I've quite arrived at you, that yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when did I start feeling like I'd arrived? At the, I mean, when did you get I, your Costco membership card? Uh, well, what have we got? Not that long ago, actually. <laughs> Just kind of pretty fairly recently. Um, I think the first time I ever paid taxes as a musician, I was like, oh, <laughs> so this thing called a 1099, huh? That's no fun. <laughs> All right. I guess I'm an adult now. <laughs> Dude, I had totally uh, forgotten about the scene in Step Brothers after they finally go their separate ways and they were kicked out of the house and Will Ferrell goes to Costco for the first time to, and he walks out with a giant pack of toilet paper like i'm an adult <laughs> that was the best. oh man i remember I mean, I that guess, moment vividly in my life <laughs> right i guess yeah. maybe the first time i got a one-bedroom apartment you know it's like i didn't have roommates anymore and it was like this little hole in the wall thing i mean i think the the complex <laughs> got torn down and they gave me like they're supposed to give you 30 days to get out of those places well they gave me like 21 days <laughs> like i didn't even realize it that the property had been bought i just noticed that like there were far less cars in the parking lot one day and so i went down to the office and i was like is something going on and like oh yeah we got bought you need to get out of here and i was like oh okay so <laughs> adulthood getting kicked out right so yeah you know I'd get your own apartment and have to fill a refrigerator by yourself you're like oh i'm an adult and I got to do this. I got to buy groceries from gig money. Okay. Now we're living. Now. <laughs> it's simple. It sounds simple to most people who don't do what we do. But right. it's, it's not. <laughs> oh, man. Exactly. Oh, well, dude, so, so then when do you start doing some of the, the, the bigger sessions that actually pay you a little bit of money and going on the road as a side man, like seriously? Right. So the first, let's see, I mean, I think the first like serious tour tour where there was like a, a bus and things like that uh, was probably with Erica Badu. And so that was like 2012, I think. Um, we went and did a tour of Europe. Um, and so that was really cool, uh, you know, obviously, because I had been to, to Europe before and, and, and things like that with one-offs and stuff like that. Um, but uh so this was like a cool you know like tour um and um let's see i mean as far as the session thing i guess maybe around maybe around that same time or a little bit after um starkey puppy was doing a lot of a lot more stuff and so there was a little bit more attention on us in the, as individuals and so like i started working with some some bigger name gospel and r and b artists um, because i've always been a part of that scene here in dallas that's kind of how i met the guys in snarky anyway was doing the groove music basically um and so i started working with kirk franklin a little bit fred hammond um and then working with a couple producers who were producing kind of bigger name r&b and hip-hop acts uh but those sessions were interesting because a lot of it was remote or just me and the producer like they weren't you know a big full band in a studio kind of session um but yeah i guess this was around like 2012, 13, 14, 15. I, I definitely in those years kind of noticed a little bit of a gradual uptick in the stuff I was doing. And, and I think a lot of it uh, had to do with, with, you know, Snarky Puppy was reaching more people. And like I said, you know, as a result, there was more attention on the individual players because of that. So, yeah, I mean, that's certainly when w around when we met and when I became yeah, aware I so. of your playing. Um, and when did, you know, I know you had a solo record early not early on but you had one what was the first one what year did that come out it was 2011 okay um, so close called, to around that time yeah yeah and and you know the thing about that is like i had been writing instrumental guitar music since i was probably 14 or something you know i mean it, i talk about it all the time it's no secret you know joe satriani was like one of my hugest influences as a kid 
and so uh, him and Steve Vai and Eric Johnson and these incredible instrumentalists, I just soaked it all up. And so I started to write my own tunes. And so by 2011, you know, I had, I had been in a rock band where I was writing tunes with the singer and it, it was fun, but it wasn't quite maybe where my creative head space was at all the time. I mean, I still love doing that and, and will continue to do that, but it was like, there was this thing inside. I was like, you need to try that. You need to try the instrument, like, just try it. Uh, maybe you'll think you're good at it. Maybe you'll like yourself enough to keep doing it. You know what I mean? Like you have to really kind of like just peel the bandaid off and see how the, see what happens. Absolutely. <laughs> and so, so that's, that's all that first record was. It was like, I had some tunes. I was like, well, these are cool. I enjoy listening to these. Let me get my friends in and we'll record them. And I don't know, I'll totally do the whole thing. Super DIY, put it out just so it's there. You know, I had, I didn't think it was going to be surfing with the alien or, <laughs> you know, I just, I was like, Hey, this is fun. And, um, but people like liked it, <laughs> you know, like in my little community, they were like, Hey, this is cool. The Deary did this like weird little guitar record. Like, yeah, cool. Not bad kid, you know? And so, so I kept doing them and, and, uh, and, and, and now it's like a thing. Now it's my thing. And, I, and I, but I don't think I would be doing it now, like where I actually get to play it with my band and make records and, tour the records and sort of have an entity as Mark Lettieri, the artist, if I hadn't done that first little record. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah, absolutely. It kind of set yeah. the, you know, it, it kind of convinced you that you're an artist. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But I, you know, I, I think that's hard to, it's hard for some people because, you know, I talk to younger players and, and, and I tell them like, you know, they're like, well, how do I do it? And I was like, well, it doesn't really matter how, just do it. Like it's the way it's going to happen is the way it's going to happen at that particular moment right. with those songs, those players, that studio, that amount of money that you don't have. Right. <laughs> right. So w once you can be okay with, with making that first step, it'll give you a perspective on how to then quantify the whole thing and turn it into a real part of your expression, you know, oh, yeah. your output. Yeah. Because, you don't even know how to do it at all until you yeah. try to do it on right. whatever, you know, and you make a ton of mistakes and things you would do better. You learn a ton. But you yeah, ever again, to it, your first record. The, oh, um, dude. Well, well, first off, my first record, I'm 13 years old. I know. Well, <laughs> on ADATS through a Mackie board in like a living room. It's the maybe the worst sounding recording in the history of music. It's possible. <laughs> Yeah. Also, I, I sing on it, and my voice hadn't a hundred percent changed. It's horrendous. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> well, hey, that's it's a out good of print. Time capsule. Out of yeah, print. Yeah, whatever. We'll find it again. <laughs> hey, dude, I'm gonna get the. This is the um, the yeah. heating guy. Yeah. This is Mark. All right. Yep, we're back. All right, cool. I'm out of coffee. Shoot. <laughs> oh man. All right, so. You've got solo record out, you're touring, you're doing sessions. When does it become like, no, not when does it become, it already has become, but when do you decide maybe to do your own thing most of the time? Was it completely organic that people started to kind of pay more interest in what you're doing? Or did you make just a conscious decision like, I need to be focused more on my own thing anyways? Right. I think it was a combination of both. Um, and I think a lot of it was me coming to terms with, the fact that it was becoming a thing. Because like I said, when I did Nose, it wasn't a thing. It was right. just a fun project. Um, but I think by my third record, Spark and Echo, mm -hmm. um, there was a tension on, on me as a player from Snarky Puppy and things like that. And so sure. I, felt, I was like, okay, so people are actually listening. M you know, Mark, maybe you need to kind of understand that this is your voice and you need to be okay with it now. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and that was just building up. That was just for me having to build up some confidence in what I was doing, you know, um, because, it, it, you know, instrumental guitar music is, it's not like a big popular genre. You, you don't really know what to do with it. You don't it's really not? know if anyone's Fuck. <laughs> right. I mean, maybe yeah. it is. Shoot. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you don't really know what to do with it or if it's a sustainable. So for me, there was a quite a bit of fear involved in like making a step towards accepting this reality right um and so but i finally kind of did 
and then you know yeah organically you see there's more attention you see people calling i think what a big part of it for me was like you know people were saying that they had found out about other projects that i was involved in because of my thing and uh, and i thought that was kind of interesting you know and that's not a a slight at, at any other band that I, I work with or anything but um it was like hey i found out about snarky puppy because of your solo stuff and i was like oh that's interesting you know because it's usually the other way around understandably snarky puppy's a very big band um and so when that kind of thing started to happen i thought okay you know maybe people are listening here and we can kind of take this and see where it's going to go um and so that's kind of how we got here <laughs> it's a leap of faith though I mean, it really is yourself. yeah we're always betting on ourselves anyways when we enter this industry but especially right. when you start to make a living as a sideman as a session guy as just a working musician number one you've hit the lottery already to some degree right. like you're doing sure. something right then you make the decision like you know what i'm gonna not take that gig that i just got called for because it interferes with what i really think i should be doing that's a yeah. big leap of faith yeah and there's definitely been a lot of those and yeah. um a lot you know and and um but you really just kind of have to trust your gut on those kinds of things you know mm -hmm. like if you turn if you really are turning down something that could be maybe financially good or visibly good for you or whatever uh yeah. you know your gut's got to tell you that you're doing the right thing and it's not going to feel good at first you're going to feel like you totally <laughs> blew it oh yes because <laughs> you're going to oh, yes. see that gig then happen without you and then yep. you're just like oh maybe i should have oh, okay but you know and then a, then a year later your record comes out and like people are into it and you're like yep all right yep. it feels good but for those six or eight months it doesn't feel good <laughs> well it's funny i i remember i don't know about your wife but i remember a sea change in my family when all of a sudden my wife was recommending i don't take that gig because it would mess up the momentum i was having sure which used to be the opposite you know it was all yeah. about just paying our bills and whatever gig not that she was forcing me i'm not i don't mean that in any way but yeah. it was you know and, and it was like no this gig pays a lot yeah but you'd have to cancel all that work and all those things yeah. you've got coming up don't do it i don't think you should do it yep. and it was like yeah things have changed wow yeah, yeah. totally man that's yeah. uh, we've had that same conversation several times you know? yeah um yeah. So, but that's, you know, that's what it is because like you said, if you, if you have a career doing this, no matter what it is that you do in music, yeah, you've hit the lottery. I mean, it's like yeah. to, to, because this is, there's no, no day is promised in this business, <laughs> as you know. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Just think if you had tried to become, you know, a, a full-time track and field person and pay your bills well, for that. The, you know, in the sense it's... It, in kind of the same the same way it's 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 very similar because i mean <laughs> track athletes are in a sense like freelancers oh yeah I mean, you get a if you're a you know you might get assigned to a, an endorsement deal with a shoe company or an apparel company that pays you a very usually a very minimal yearly salary i mean do most of them end up coaches much. at colleges basically i would imagine so or, or private uh you know trainers personal trainers that kind of thing um, interesting but you know you get a, a very small salary and then you might be able to command an appearance fee at some point or you might mm -hmm. win some money if you win a race but it's still it's like gig to gig you know unless you're usain bolt or somebody like that <laughs> yeah, but then it's just like well then unless you're eric clapton you know <laughs> so, it's a hundred percent yeah 100%. yeah it's it's very similar oh, you know all right Let's jump into to the 10 questions. Okay. All right. Number one, we didn't actually, we didn't give this answer away yet, so I'm glad. When oh, you first right. started learning and playing the guitar, what was the first lick or tune or riff or whatever that when you figured it out and got it under your fingers, it was like, you know, that feeling of, I can't believe I figured this out. I, I'm never doing anything. Uh, you know, that feeling like, I can't believe I learned this. Yeah yeah oh man i know it's i wish you had prefaced me with these questions because i probably would have <laughs> been able to play it for you but, right um oh man dude that's a good one dang it Can we like you know you were that? so proud of yourself that you you figured it out it like it ignited the spark forever <laughs> yeah um i don't know dude <laughs> i don't know i mean because like the uh Probably a lot of the stuff that I taught myself by ear was probably wrong. <laughs> okay. yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but, um, gosh. We'll what was the first, like, song by, you know, a, a, 
a band you were into at around that time okay. that, yeah that you you yeah. learned um well i guess you know heck yeah okay i think probably the first time that my garage band we played like enter sandman all the way through okay you know yeah, yeah. i mean th when you're 13 or something and you're like i think those experiences like where we would learn a song and kind of be able to play it all the way through mm -hmm. uh you know i remember when we did sweet child of mine the first time and then we oh yeah it at a at, we played it at a high school uh like kind of talent show thing and you know you feel like you're a freaking rock star I mean, who <laughs> sang that uh, one of our girlfriends, um, not actual like girlfriend, but like a friend who was a girl, uh, yeah. because yeah, you're not going to find a 16 year old boy who can like hit those notes and not have yeah. his voice just crack into oblivion. Right. So, yeah. so our friend, <laughs> so our friend Dana Barnes did it and she did a great job. Um, yeah. so that was really fun. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, if you think of something, we'll come back to it. <laughs> okay. You think right. of a, a thing. All right. What, what's the first guitar solo? That you ever learned note for note, like you loved it so much, you had to learn that solo. Um, oh crap! There was a time when I could play "Serving with the Alien" note for note. Really? Close to it. Alien. You, yeah, you, you I, I think note. I at the time knew that one note for note. Um, I I got real into the into the into those records. Um, I'm sure there was probably. Oh man! Was surfing with the alien your favorite Satch record? It's one of them. I go back and forth between a couple. The one that did it for me with him was this was the self titled record, which was kind uh -huh. of like the not Satch record. Yeah, kind of. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, not well, not not Satch, but like it had a totally different flavor than Flying yeah. in the Blue Dream, for example. Flying um, in the Blue Dream was mine favorite one. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah. uh, but. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I, I definitely had some kind of breakthroughs jammed along to that self-titled record, just kind of, because there's some tunes on there that are groove, they're kind of groove rock tunes, you know, and so that sure. for me was pretty, pretty big. Um, one other solo, I mean, I think I probably learned the Freebird solo all the way through at one point. Sure, sure. Um, you know, uh, let's see. Are there Maybe solos the now Child that Hendrix solo? Are there ones that you'll just never forget? Like it doesn't matter. Twenty years could go by. And you could just bust it out right now because you played it so many times. <laughs> I don't mean play um, it right now. I just mean in general. Yeah, probably I I can usually get and they're and they're not like crazy rocket science solos, but like the one from Little Red Corvette I can usually oh. do every time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe the one from Rosanna I can do every time. Ah, <laughs> um, yeah. I wish I could do Kid Charlemagne. That's one of those ones that like I'll nail and then never play it for whatever reason and then i'm like oh crap and then it'll come back to me real quick you know yeah. um what are some other ones it's mostly kind of rock rock based solos like uh oh gosh i'm sure like living on a prayer i could probably do i could probably do oh, okay you know, don't stop believing you know because i probably had to do them in cover bands at some point so you're playing them every night anyway almost yeah. every night so um, you and i are also so we're well, just a a generation removed from kind of Van Halen right when it hits, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, but I mean, was there a lot of, did you work on that a lot? <laughs> I, I did. I had, I definitely had some phases and I've talked about this a little bit. Like I could never, I could never really play like that. No, you know? And I could never really play like any of my heroes, but, but the Eddie thing, it was like, I almost didn't even want to try to attempt a lot of it. <laughs> I felt the same way. Um, so it was like, for me, I would, I soaked up a lot of the rhythm guitar stuff and then some of the lead stuff I would get, but I think it, it really, I just internalized the feel of all of it. Um, maybe more so than the actual technique and that sure. kind of thing. Um, so that was big. And I, yeah, and I definitely like jammed along to Van Halen. One, and I, I mean, I probably played Mean Street 7,000 times, but yeah. I probably never played the solo, but I played the riff a hundred, yeah. you know. Yeah, same, uh, same, yeah. You kind of, so that, so that kind of connection, it's, I think. It's funny, really Van Halen was always one of those things where even being a, a guitar player and being totally blown away by the way he played and loving every second of it, every time it came on, I felt instantly more just like a fan and less like a guitar player. I just wanted Isn't to that, listen to it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I, th that's, that's, yeah, it's almost like you just want to appreciate it. 
and that's not to say that like my other influences I don't appreciate because I actually like tried to emulate them or whatever. Right. But, yeah. I don't know. It's, that's a really weird thing, but, but even still uh, now I think I go and I go back and I listen to a lot of my influences and I don't pick up the guitar because I don't, you know, I just want to enjoy the music. I just want to enjoy the playing. Yeah. I want to, I want to feel that connection again without, you know, mm-hmm. maybe turning it into a technique thing yep. or whatever. Yeah, which so, is a nice feeling to remember yeah. just what it's like to, to love music not as a, a, a job. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, what's the first thing you play when you pick up a guitar most days? Do your hands just go somewhere automatically, like a pet thing or just something that happens? <laughs> I probably play like some kind of goofy Mixolydian blues lick. Really? Yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> that. So. Yeah. I mean. What do you do? I well, I I used to play this thing in E, but it it became such a comic relief moment with all whoever was on the road with me, in any when I was a side man on my own gig, whatever, because they would parrot it back to me before I could even hit standby on my amp, and it was like. <laughs> It was always I've every time you, I hit standby. <laughs> yeah, every time. So I had to stop doing it like every time, you know. Yeah. yeah. Sounds nice. I like that. It's a good yeah. one. Yeah. But what about if you go into a guitar store and you oh, want to okay. get a feel if you want to like know if you like a guitar. You have a little thing. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Bro, I have the worst guitar store chops ever. Oh, but what uh, if you're like want to know if a guitar's good? Do you have little things you do to to test um, it, basically? I'll play some some rhythm, some funk kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, just to see how the response is. Yeah. Um, you know, so I might just kind of chunk on. Yeah. Whatever it is, and you you know, sometimes if you play something that's repetitive and musical, then the the store employee will come talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know like oh, it sounds kind of like a song over there what's going on yeah you know hello yeah. sir what is it in wayne's world man where's oh i know i'll play the may i help you riff the may i help you riff and they yeah. play stairway completely out of tune yeah so, oh, may man. i help you yeah may i help you yeah again yeah again yeah. can i put the fender back now wayne yeah <laughs> she will be mine oh yes yeah, like, not today she sir. will I'm be mine saucy i think i'm gonna buy it Cha-ching. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. I'm okay. this one I'm curious about because I I don't associate well maybe I do associate you subconsciously with a certain groove or style and and I'm sure other people do but do you have a groove or a style or a key or something that just kind of goes on a loop in your head when you're cooking when you're doing something with your daughter when you're driving the car whatever what what just makes its way in all the time? Do you hear some oh, sort of musical narration? Weird. I hear beats a lot. Probably yeah. maybe more so than guitar melodies or something like that. I mean, I do hear those and things like that as we all do. But yeah, uh, yeah, rhythm mostly. I think or a like syncopations. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. So when you listen to music, then is that your first inclination? Like if a song comes on you've never heard. Are you rhythmically subdividing that tune? Are you improvising over it? Are you, you know, harmonizing the melody? Or what, like what do you? I, what's your first thing? Am I playing thing? along with it? Is that what no, you're saying? No, no. If you just, if, if you're in the store and a song comes on the loudspeaker you've never heard, where's yeah. your brain go normally for the Probably first the time? Probably the groove. Probably the groove. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think nowadays I, I I listen to to feel. Like not not like I listen to the feel of the song because a lot of what maybe in contemporary pop music there's a lot of kind of like gridded sort of stuff and so I like to try to like I'm like how does this feel you know like, is this gridded is this not is everything snapped are the you know is that a real guitar <laughs> you know so I maybe I'm listening to like production elements and stuff like that um, and sometimes that gridded stuff can feel really cool you know you never you never really know. It's a very weird feeling to know it's a real guitar, but it's not a real guitar because it's yeah. a real guitar that someone played eight months earlier and they bought in a sample pack For and then they bars. chopped it up and lined it up. And, you know, like, it, yeah, yeah, but it, it could end up being something very cool. But yeah, 
And sometimes you can't even tell. Sometimes I'll hear something and I'll assume this guy played it, and then I'll meet the person. And they'll go, "Yeah, that's not what I played. They chopped that shit up and moved this around." And yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. weird stuff. Um, okay, well, along those not along the same lines, but when did you feel like? you were starting to find kind of your voice on the guitar. Was there a moment of like, oh, I like this little thing I just did here, or I like this world I'm getting into. I should go further this way. Hmm. Yeah, I think I, I started to really kind of develop a lot of that through writing my own music. I think course, that's yeah. been that's always been my vehicle for figuring out what I sound like. And I've noticed that it can be pretty diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, which I think in some respects is really good. And I think in some respects can be confusing for the listener because maybe they yes. go, well, you know, what is, cause he, does he do everything or does he do nothing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I can't help that, I guess, because what comes out is what's going to come out. Yeah. Um, but, and this might take, maybe it's just my ears, but like I can hear myself in all of my compositions. And I, and I think the more people listen to it, to, they can start to hopefully hear that kind of stuff too. Um, it might just, it might just not be so surface level, perhaps. Um, I think I have a, maybe some compositional elements that, that show up a lot, maybe more so than playing elements, I think. Okay. Uh, right. So yeah, so that, that, that might be part of how I start to kind of develop my, sound i mean you know i sort of have my funk thing that i do but then i kind of have my like progressive rock thing that i do and then there's sort of all this weird shit in between <laughs> well yeah but to me that's kind of you know if someone asked me you know put me on the spot and said well what does mark do what's he sound like i've never heard your friend you know i said well he he kind of is a great rhythm guitar player with great time and and really understands a lot of styles of funk and r&b and then he plays rock guitar, you know, and like, he does it in a way that it, it doesn't like sound jarring. He kind of is both things and it sounds like him, you know, well, I don't know, well, I guess. Thanks, yeah. 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 I'll, I'll take it. I'll put that. Yeah. yeah thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So go ahead and use that on your next, next I press. I put it on my bio. Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> Could probably get oh, a lot of man. delete a lot of those paragraphs that are on there now. <laughs> well, dude, it's weird. Like when you try to think about what makes you, you, you know, it's like I I used to be more obsessed with it than I am now. But it was like because like, cause it was coming out of the Stevie Ray Vaughan thing of I I can't just be Stevie Ray Vaughan. So I went completely the other way for a while. Like I need to I need to find my voice. I need to you know <laughs> blah 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 and. But it was when I started to realize I was playing blues and mixing it up with jazz and, and playing that Danny Gatton kind of hybrid picking thing all in one kind of thing. And it finally felt like, oh, maybe I am doing something that sounds like me. And then the decision is always, I'm going to go there. I'm going further that way every day, yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 That's good. When, and okay, I know this is, you're interviewing me, but I want to interview you. When, and, how, and how far into your playing journey were you when that you kind of saw that how many solo records did it take before you it took man i felt like i didn't start to find that until i was 19 or 20 for real you know what i mean mm -hmm. so that's that's, pretty that's early, though. three records in three records okay. into my career as a blues musician back then but by 20 was when i felt like when I was on stage with other blues people, because up until that time I was I was always just in blues circles, playing with older dudes, and and that was when I started to notice like I'd be sitting in or jamming with people, and it was like, oh wait a minute, I listen to and know way more music than a lot of these guys. They're not listening to any of this stuff I'm, I've I've now kind of started listening to, and there's there is something happening here that's different, you know, and yeah. So then I went further that way. Every it was always like. Wherever I could make a turn that led me further down that path, I would take that turn, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have that kind of self-awareness, though, you know. But I think the only way you can really get there is if you try your hand at making your own music. Oh, yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And, 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 but like you said, some of it is tied to composition. 
and for me that's an issue it's like so like you i write shit all over the map and it's like i may want to make a record that's like this or like that or like this it's it, it's it's i'm still going to sound like me over the top of it the same you are going to sound like you but this record is totally different and for the listener sometimes that can be confusing because in their mind, oh, that's the guy from Snarky Puppy or that's that blues guitar player. Why is he doing all this rock shit or why has he got a big band record? You know what I mean? Like whatever. Yeah. I yeah. always, I mean, but, you know, even, but, you know, if we look at all of our influences, man, it's like the, the, the artists that really touched us, they never really made the same record twice, you know? I mean, yeah. you know, so I think that kind of, I mean, I talk about Prince all the time. It's like that guy, <laughs> yeah his records are all over the place and he's got like thousands of them. Yep. You know, to me, yeah. that's interesting. If I can hear an artist where it's like, whoa, and then, whoa, but I get the connection. Oh like, yeah. There's I don't think literally one is. Yeah. There's no artist that's so separate that you really just cannot tell. Right. Yep. Yep. I mean, there's that DNA that's going to align the things. Um, You're right. Ways. You're right. Yeah. Any Prince thing you put on, even if it's some random weird Prince, which there's plenty of that, you still know right. it's Prince right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Totally. yeah, absolutely. All right. Number six, okay. what do you consider your biggest weakness on the guitar? Oof. Where should we start? <laughs> <laughs> um, I am always, I'm always kind of working on like pitch and vibrato and stuff like that. You know, just kind wow. of making sure the stuff is really I'm not, I mean, in tune, but just like, you know, focused in control, I should say. I'm always kind of trying to work on my control, I think, a little bit. Um, definitely kind of when I lean more into the rock thing, um, because I do love players like Eddie Van Halen, which have they have such a freeform thing in their mm -hmm. minds. I feel like I have an extension of that, but it's a little bit too loose <laughs> okay. in some, in some respects to where like, it does sort of sound like I'm falling down a flight of stairs. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and maybe not landing on my feet. Right. And so, um, I am kind of, lo I, I do focus on trying to kind of keep that looseness, but also ma make sure that it is kind of staying in the group. So it doesn't really sound totally lost. Mm -hmm. Right. And this might be something that only I notice because I'm sitting here at my home studio. If I record a solo for someone, I'm like, what the hell was that? Like yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's played, you know? Um, so it's, it's those kind of things. And I think it all just comes down to like an element of, of keeping myself under control, maybe. Interesting. You know? So yeah. you, you to, think about your vibrato thing. still. You, a it's bit. a conscious thing. You think about your vibrato still. That's a conscious thing that you think about. Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, especially because I, you know, when I listen to recordings that I did and I'm like, ah, that was a little pitchy or like, oh, that was, you know, maybe I, yeah, I do think about that stuff. I, I, I mean, I listen to myself like under a microscope, dude. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because well, we I mean, problems, when you're but... doing tracks for, for other people and you're by yourself in the studio, yeah, yeah maybe that's it's, it's sometimes that. unavoidable. It's like, Right. You know, number one, if it's not, dude, the second you're sitting in a studio with other people and you get it close enough and everybody's happy, you're immediately happy. But when you're right. home by yourself, it's like, well, that that one little eight second part could be better. I'm going to redo those eight seconds, you know, yeah. or this. And oh, let me fly this one from here. And let me, they'll it's never impossible. see it. Let me do. I'm going to consolidate impossible. the tracks. Yeah. Right. It's impossible yeah. to record at home and, and be in the same mindset as recording in the studio under yeah. the gun with some impossible yeah and it's really funny because you know you'll do a session at a studio or something and think like oh man i kind of maybe that maybe I, that could have been better or something like that yeah yeah and then and then you do a track at home for somebody think it's perfect yeah and you're the one you did the studio I'm like oh it's kind of killing feels good it's kind of loose and fresh and then this other one sounds <laughs> kind of sterile and sort of surgically a hundred percent you know so, you could give yeah, me the least, same tune to blow a solo over, and I'll go into a studio somewhere else and almost 98% of the time knock it out on the first take. And where I'll do it here in my studio at home, it'll take me an later. hour. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, an hour. Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, man. That, yeah, it is because it's, it's because we're alone. <laughs> right. Yeah, the luxury of yeah. technology is... Yeah, uh, forces into that hole. But that that 
those dirt, those thoughts start seeping in. Like it could be better, bro. That wasn't yeah. the, your best, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. oh. And this literally all we do now because of what's going on is we already did it plenty, but now it's all we do is sit here and play by ourselves mm -hmm. and look at a fucking camera. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Oh, all right. Number seven, who's Number seven. a big influence on your guitar playing that people would be surprised to hear? Right. Uh, of course, now I can't answer it. Um, I don't talk about Ty Tabor nearly enough. Oh, okay. Yeah. I yeah. need to. Um, Ty Tabor and Andy Summers. All right. Um, I All right. love the way that those guys arpeggiate i love the way they write riffs i love their sounds i love the way that they make trios sound awesome um yeah. i love ty i love ty's tone i mean i love king's x i've, I've talked about that band a ton but i don't sure. i need to talk about ty more and, and what an incredible player that guy is um and big influence too yeah ty and and, and, and yeah like i said andy summers i had a big police phase too um and I think having listened to those guys so much um, really helped me understand how to be the only guitar player in a band and just take up the right amount of space. Yeah. yeah. But not too much, but not, you know, not do anything, right? Well, playing in a trio is a, is a weird thing because <laughs> there's a difference between like an instrumental guitar trio and like a band mm -hmm. trio. And then right. even in those scenarios – there's, there's, I mean, there, you've got so much variables. You've got cream where everybody's busy, you know, and, and then you've got like the opposite, like mountain or, or the right. police or something, you know, where there's just parts and the drummer may be busy, but the bass is really simple, you know, and there's all these formulas for how to make a trio work. And yeah, Andy Summers is, is an interesting one to me in, in that mm -hmm. setting. Because yeah. it doesn't seem to, on paper, I wouldn't think the police actually works as a trio. And yet it really fucking works. Yep. Totally. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'll, I'll, yeah. Those are valid answers. I'll accept those. That's good. Okay. Well, those are my answers. <laughs> See <So you> better. <laughs> you know, King's X, for, as funny as a kid, I didn't get King's X. Like, when I first. I didn't heard find it. out about him until college. Oh, really? And it was actually through. Um, I, I, I found out about Eric Gales. Oh, and okay. Like, yeah, you know, and bought an Eric Gales record and was like, this guy, you know, it's fucking Eric Gales. He's amazing, right? Yep. So I love the record. And then I was just kind of reading some stuff online and people were like, yeah, you know, there's like a King's X element. And I was like, King's X, I don't remember that yeah. band from like guitar magazines, you know? And so then I bought one of the records and I was like, why did I not know about this earlier? I mean, it was one of those things where it was just like, where has this band been there my was, whole life? I mean, I, I'm, a few, I'm older than you, uh, but there was a, I can't remember the song, but there was a video they played on MTV on Headbangers Ball, only at night. Was it Summerland? Yeah, yeah or, maybe so. Uh, yeah. What's the name of that? Uh, Over My Head. Yeah, that I remember that, that one. That one was yeah. a bit, I apparently, was, yeah, you were probably there when, when there was a thing, but <laughs> yeah. I remember, sorry. I, <laughs> I remember... I have seen that video and Doug has like this amazing. Yes. Yeah. Thing, yeah. you know, yeah. and they're on a mountain somewhere. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. Okay. Over my yeah. head. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was like, that was all I ever knew. Cause I couldn't Google them yet. And, and I, I guess I just, it never hit me enough that I went down to the record store and bought the record. You know what I mean? So right. that was literally my only slice of King's X for probably 15 years. Until, mm. uh, you know, there was enough technology where I could just dig in on my own time, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they're a special band. Very special oh, yeah. band. Plus, I always remember there was an ad. Was it Zion guitars he played? What was the guitar he played back then? He had a couple. Yeah, he had a Yamaha and he had a Zon. Was it? No, Zion. Was it a Blade? Band. Remember the Blade uh, or the Zion? It had, like, the rail pickups was, in it. Like, like I can't It remember. may have been a Zion. Yeah. Yeah, and he was playing. Yeah, the Zion. I think the we had the Strat Elite for a while, and yeah, yeah. I think the Zion was like, yeah, maybe post Dogman era. I, don't I remember that because there was an ad, and that was how I learned about anything. Was an ad in Guitar Player magazine or Guitar right. for I remember the Practice? The, I remember the Ty Tabor Yamaha ad. That's what yeah, okay. he, had a, he had a signature Yamaha for a while, but it was like that was a weird period because 
the cover of that magazine was like Papa Roach or somebody like that. You know? <laughs> yes. This is my era, right? And then I'd yeah. open it and go, I was like, oh, Ty Tabor, King's Out. Okay. And that's what I remember from that magazine, not the Papa Roach article. but the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, you know. I do remember in in the stories about Gales, them them mentioning King's X quite frequently mm -hmm. about their yeah. Gales band. So yeah. I, I remember that as well. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I told Eric this recently. I had a, a ripped out a page, an interview with him in Guitar Player, and I think it was in that interview they asked him about King's X, but I had it on my wall, <laughs> this page nice. from Guitar Player. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. Man, man, man. Uh, number eight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> would you rather have a good guitar and a shitty amp or vice versa? <laughs> a great amp and a bad guitar. I on a gig. I would rather have uh, the guitar. Definitely. Really? Got to be a good guitar. It's or, or at least something that feels comfortable in my hands. Because I've okay. played through a lot of all kinds of amps. I mean, dude, I... I've done snarky puppy tours with 112 solid state fender things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just like whatever we could fit in the trailer kind of vibe, mm -hmm. but it was my ax. And so I was able to kind of at least get my, my point across from a feel perspective. The hmm. tone in the front of the house may have been complete garbage, but at least it probably felt decent. <laughs> so you <laughs> felt I, like that gave a better gig performance for you than maybe vice versa, having a real, an amp you really love and some eh guitar. Well, I guess it depends on your definition of eh guitars. I mean, if it's like, because I mean, I guess theoretically you could have, <coughs> excuse me, a not so great guitar, but if it's at least set up to your liking, you might have mm -hmm. a fighting chance. You know, I think, and for me, that's generally the start, the starting point. I mean, the, if if, it, if the feel of the instrument is at least there, that's a baseline for me. You know. Um, mm -hmm. But, I don't know, you sound like you disagree. No, no well, I do disagree, <laughs> but, but I get it. Everybody's I'm on, different. Yeah. I'm, I'm the opposite, so I, I, okay. I'd be better with my amp and pedals and stuff and whatever guitar than vice versa. Like, if I had uh -huh. this and my pedal board and a solid-state Fender or a JC120, that gig would be worse than the other way around. Even yeah. if I was forced to play a gig with a Squire with 10s on it, through my rig, that would be a better gig, I think. Interesting. Yeah, I think it to it, it's totally dependent on the player, and I can see I can see that. I, I can, I'm trying to think of experiences where I've like I've maybe had to borrow a guitar for a gig, and well, that's definitely happened. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know what? In fact, I would prefer I would prefer the guitar, because I just uh, not too long ago, I, I actually it was a it was a gig. I was like, wow, we did a gig. It was a live stream thing. And, okay. uh, and I had an issue with one of my strats and the tuning thing busted and I had to borrow my buddy's strat, a fine guitar, but it wasn't set up for me, but I had my amp and my pedals. And I just remember trying to play things that I normally play and they just weren't happening. Mm. And, uh, okay. and I was like, man, I've got all my pedals. I got my rig, but if the ax is not my ax, it's like, Oh no. So all it's right. different strokes for different folks, you know. Different, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough, man. Yeah. All right, number nine. What keeps you growing uh, and pushing as a musician? Like, what mo motivates you to be better tomorrow than today? Probably watching and MFs like you oh, on, come on. <laughs> on Instagram. No, man. I mean, it's no, all smoke real, and though, mirrors, bro. Uh, That's all smoke and yeah, mirrors. You're not even wearing pants right now. I mean, yeah. It's the... <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, it's, that's definitely a, a, a factor, like seeing my homies do cool stuff, you know, yeah. just, and it, and it keeps me, it keeps me motivated, makes me jealous, you know, <laughs> like all the, all the fire and ice of, of those kinds of things, you know? Um, I don't think people from the outside really truly understand how big a motivating factor jealousy is, especially among <laughs> guitar players. <laughs> Probably so. It, it, as long as you turn it into something positive, if it yeah. hits you up at night, it's no good. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I am inspired by, by you and, and, our, and our, our crew, you know, our, yeah. our, our bros and sisters. Right back you at know. you. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, our brothers and sisters in guitar. And so that's cool to see. But, um, man, I, I, get, I get inspired by – 
um, lately I've just been more in tune with my, with my life around me, man. You know, it's mm. like, I got a new, I got a little kid and, and just yeah. like, you know, you watch them grow and all of a sudden you're just like, man, I sort of like look at things differently now, you know, you, sure. get, you get sort of this, maybe I'm just getting older, dude. It's like, you just get clarity that about too. stuff and it, <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, and it comes out in your music. You don't really maybe see it when it's happening, but, but after you're done with it, you're like, oh yeah, this is, this is a result of these things in my life you know so becoming but is more there, aware of that stuff i think is big for me is there a uh, a part of you though that like is concerned in any way about you know being a bigger or not bigger a better player and musician all the time or do you let that take care of itself and then sidebar do you also have any concern about like maintaining you know keeping the the, the baseline so you never regress do you think yeah. about those things oh. at all I mean, I do. I, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say I like the uh, maybe stress uh, on them. Um, but I think I just want, I think maybe as a professional, I want to be equipped for anything I would possibly throw myself into. Mm -hmm. um, I don't ever want to end up in a gig situation where I can't do the work. I right. think j and that's, that's just from a strictly baseline working musician perspective. Like I don't want to get a call for something and have to be like, I can't really do that. Yeah, and maybe, but maybe there is certain situations where I have to. Or I just have to say that, and that's just the way it is. But sure, I don't want to have to say that because I neglected to put in the work to get to that point where I could have said yes, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. <clears throat> so you know, f for me, I think just in the past seven, eight months, where we've all just been sort of <laughs> sitting at home trying to figure out what to do with our lives, um, I've been writing a lot, and frankly, I, I thought I was going to be way more uh creative when this whole thing hit but yeah. i just lost it i mean it just fell yeah. apart and yeah. and I, I mean this this baritone record that i'm finishing right now i didn't even really start writing it until september yeah you know and i was thinking like i was gonna have it d out in september i was like oh no gigs i'll make a record <laughs> and yeah. then it was just like the world caught fire <laughs> and so did my emotions basically and then i just sort of like lost the really, you know, yeah, you know, I'm talking about real stuff here, but, um, dude, I've not written anything the entire yeah, pandemic, no, there, nothing. There you go. There yeah. you go, man. So, you know, that kind of stuff, I can say maybe worries me a little bit because in a sense, I feel like I'm maybe losing ground or losing traction or like people are going to forget about me or, you know, Oh, I don't think that's of, the case, you know, well, but, I, but yeah. you never know. I mean, I, I don't want to say that, but it's like, you know, if, if you, there's a weird, kind of like odd pressure about being an artist to like main you know maintain relevancy or some kind of thing yeah. in this day and age where stuff happens so fast yes you know what i'm saying it's like and if you feel like you aren't constantly in people's faces that they're gonna just forget yes we forget about you know we're in a day and age of 15 seconds and that's it yeah <laughs> it's a vicious cycle because you need to rem keep reminding people that you exist, and then you need that affirmation from them to keep reminding you and stroking <laughs> your ego and all that bullshit, which is my that's yeah. the thing I hate the most. And yet, I, of course, it exists. You know what I mean? Like I need right. that feeling, that that rush of oh, they like this one. Okay, yeah, yeah, you know. But it's like, no. dude, quite honestly. This pandemic, for me, yeah, I've been not creative at all. The whole reason we're even having this conversation right now and that I'm putting effort into YouTube and all this stuff is not to try to make a living or to try to keep my name out there. It's literally to keep me occupied because <laughs> I have to do something because it was getting out of control. I was doing nothing but, like, practicing guitar, and then I was getting frustrated with that. You know what I mean? Like, I, nothing was fulfilling anything at all so i was like i had to find some sort of outlet yeah. well good yeah right. that's how we adapt man i mean it's like yeah as creative people you have to find something you know yeah, well, so. yeah that's it i think that's been the hardest thing when i talk to non-creative people you know during this pandemic who are also struggling and mm -hmm. some who maybe haven't been able to work or, or now maybe they have figured out and they're working from home or their lives have changed too and it's like, yeah, we're all in the same boat, but, uh, you know, it's hard for people to relate to us because, like, our our whole identity almost is tied to that job. And a lot of people's 
wouldn't say that their job defines them. It's just the way they pay their bills, you know? Right. And so it makes our job so gratifying, but it also makes it so devastating when it's taken away from us. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I mean, you know, here's hoping that things come around, dude. I don't know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're guitar players. We're like cockroaches. You can't kill us. That's true. <laughs> true enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Well, then that leads us to number 10, okay. which is, do you have a five-year plan? Is there something like in stone that you want to accomplish? Like, I want to do this, or is it more just going with the flow and kind of seeing what happens and continuing on what you're doing already? It's like probably 60-40. So it's, okay. for me, it's 60%. I know exactly where I want to be in five years. Okay. 40%. Hey, <laughs> hey, yeah. uh, and that varies. Sometimes it's 70, 30. Sometimes it's like, yeah. Hey, just happy to be here guys. You know? Um, but I am passionate about the music that I make, the records that I create, the stuff I have, a, my own personal voice. And, and, um, I would like to one, you know, have that be the main thing, you know, and, and be sort of, uh, have my sort of career and family life kind of structured around yeah. the Mark Letiri thing. But having said that, and here's where the 40% or 50% is, I love playing in Snarky Puppy. I love playing, you know, Fearless Flyers. I love doing session work. I love backing up artists. I love, uh -huh. you know, teaching. I love dealing with her, you know, whatever. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can do that, but of course. Um, that's a joke. I, you know, I love so many of the, of the gifts that I've been given to do music just in whatever capacity that I can't say no to that kind of stuff. Right. You know, because there are so many different opportunities that come around and, and sometimes, yeah, I can, I'll take a break from the Latiri thing if something's really cool and I just want to do it because it's going to challenge me or, uh, you know, or help me grow in some way. And, and ultimately it all makes my own stuff a little bit better and more into integral, you know, and real. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll Good see answer. what happens, man. I don't know. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, dude, huh. you made me all like, if I look at the ground, it means I'm like, you know, getting yeah. emotional. <laughs> well, dude, it, it is. I mean, we're, you know, like, like we said already, you're, we're lucky to even be able to pay our bills doing any of these things that we do and to like maintain a, a stable life and family <laughs> and things like that. But yeah, the, there's always this hope of, man, it would be nice to just do like, my thing only in right. the way that I actually see it, want it and want it to be. And right. and it doesn't mean I need millions of dollars. It just needs I need enough to do that, keep everybody happy and responsibly safe and yeah. uh, you know, so let me just get there. <clears throat> let me get to that right. level. Yeah, you, you can't know? put a dollar amount on that because no you know, when you get there you don't know what that is gonna be. Exactly. Like, you know, yeah. and so yeah. um but, uh, but I, you know, I think we're very similar in that respect because we do, our passions are pretty diverse yes. beyond doing our own thing. But, you know, thankfully we get to do a lot of our own thing. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you're watching this, thanks for listening to our stuff. Yes. Thank you for <laughs> coming for, to our show for supporting everything yeah. that we do. And speaking yeah. of that. There will be links to all things Mark Letiri in the right. in the description of this video. Okay. So please support if you don't already have his albums and That's his good. pedals and his instructional material and <laughs> all of those things. You know, Signature please do jock that. strap. And, uh, yeah. That's yeah, coming like, next. We're gonna have some cool merch for 2021. <laughs> nice. I don't. You would be yeah, man. I get the red like do the cameo ones. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I oh, do. But thank you for doing this. It's greatly oh, appreciated. Pleasure, this was great. I'm glad we got to hang. Yeah. This is the first All time right. we hung out like since what Nam? Since Nam. Yeah. yeah. That's sad. Uh, <laughs> All right, members. If if you're not a member, hit join now or at least subscribe and support the channel. And if you are a member, we'll be right back and we'll do the turn two. So yeah. ruling. Ruling. <laughs>